So I will continue from this model. This, as I mentioned, is a CFA model or a measurement model of language. And this is the syntax for language. Now, in, in these options, you can, uh, you can basically first go to output options because that allows you to choose Mardia's coefficients and reliability indices as well as additional fit statistics. Why do we want to do this? Um, as Jamovi is estimating them, uh, it's, it's going to take some time. I'm going to go to the slides that I have. Why do we want to do this? It's because in most structural equation modeling analyses we need to uh, get an idea about the normality of the data and if there are any outliers you want to treat them. I have discussed this in the previous video. Uh, not exactly the outliers I should say, but I've, I've uh, discussed how to uh, modify the model if the model doesn't fit. Uh, and then, uh, well, fit statistics and the average variance extracted, sorry, it's, it has to be extracted, and uh, reliability and parameter estimation methods and uh, path coefficients and structural path uh, coefficients and the path diagram itself should be uh, looked into and uh, if there's any problems with them we should try to uh, solve the problems before we report them. So let's go back to Jamovi. It's still taking some time um, before those uh, statistics are estimated. Let's wait for it for a while. Okay, so they are now estimated. Uh, the first thing we need to look at is Mardius coefficient, which is right in this uh, table. Mardius coefficient is an index, or actually two indices, for uh, multivariate normality. One of them is the multivariate skewness, as you see, and the other one is multivariate uh, kurtosis. Uh, the multivariate skewness and uh, kurtosis coefficients should be around 10 and not more than 10. And as you see, the kurtosis has uh, gone way above uh, the limit of 10. And there is a significant p-value, which indicates that there is a significant deviation from normality, for, from multivariate normality. Skewness in the same way has been violated. So what should we do if we have uh, a uh, kind of uh, two mod modia coefficients, which indicate that there's little or no normality in the data? We need to go to uh, parameter option, uh, model options. Uh, under model options, we've got estimates uh, or estimation methods. Uh, click on this and we see a bunch of different estimation methods. I have discussed this in the previous video. Um, what I suggest is that instead of using maximum likelihood method of estimation, if you have a big deviation uh, from normality, which is the case here, as, as you see in the kurtosis, I think you can use uh, generalized least squares mo uh, estimations. If you have a smaller sample, you can use weighted least square. Here, uh, the GLS uh, would be quite useful for you to, uh, you know, uh, to use. Another option will be just leave it to uh, Jamovi to decide for you, so you can leave it, uh, keep it as automatic. But again, if you do automatic, um, and if you write a paper, reviewers might ask you what does automatic mean and what did Jamovi decide for you. So it's a good idea for you to know uh, your options and to read a little bit about these uh, in details. Now next thing is reliability statistics. And you see that there are several reliability statistics here. Um, one of them is Omega and the other one is Alpha. Actually it has not been outputted yet because there is zero. I'm going to click on reliability indices. Sometimes Jamovi actually uh, you know, does not output what you want it to output. Um, so I, I think we should give it some time. I'm going to show you what these reliability statistics mean exactly. Jamovi outputs uh, Chromebooks Alpha for each of those CFF, CA, uh, CFA models and also a McDonald's Omega uh, which are both coefficients of reliability. What's the difference between them and which one should we prefer? Um, Omega is a new um, uh, advancement in psychometrics and statistics. Uh, a lot of people prefer Omega to Chromebox Alpha and the reason for that is that uh, Chromebox Alpha even though it's being used a lot 
is dominantly used in many research fields, it has very uh, strict assumptions. One of the assumptions is that your data or your, your scales should be strictly unidimensional. And there should be equal factor loadings, uh, it's also known as tau equivalence. In most uh, of the cases you don't have this, and this is easily violated, because factor loadings can, can be different from one uh, item to another item that's measuring the same construct. And also, the uh, errors should be completely uncorrelated, and if there is any correlation between the errors on those items, uh, you know, one of the assumptions of alpha is uh, could be either violated or could be attenuated. Now, uh, there's one more thing we uh, that we should remember. It's that when factor loadings are not equal, but they're very high, uh, alpha generally leads to a similar rel reliability value compared to omega. So if you uh, look at the uh, those beta coefficients in your SEM models or CFA models, and if you see that they're high, uh, or factor loadings or beta coefficients are used interchangeably, they're basically referring to the same thing, then um, you will see that omega and uh, Crumbach's alpha are pretty similar to each other. Now one more thing, just based on my own experience, is that most often I I see that uh, McDonald's Omega and Chromebox Alpha are extremely similar to each other. Um, you know, so I think it, it really is really a judgment call for you. But if you would like to um, read more about the differences and similarities between the two statistics, I suggest that you read these two papers. I'll Make sure to leave uh, the the links to these papers, or just the citation as you see here, uh, to these papers in the comment section or the description section of this video. So let's go back to uh, our model. So I should say that uh, we're lucky because uh, Jamovi finally finished uh, estimating those statistics. First of all, Chromebox Alpha is 0 0.638. Uh, and there are three omegas here, they're estimated in different ways, slightly different ways, but most often they're very similar or exactly the same. In this case, uh, omega values are exactly the same. So as you see, alpha is only slightly below omega. Um, that's why a lot of people think that alpha basically gives you the lower bound of reliability, whereas omega is not necessarily an estimation of the lower bound of the reliability of your um, model. So which one to report? In this case, I think what I'm going to report is omega. Why is it so? Because the factor loadings, as I show you, are not very high. So let's look at the factor loadings. These are the factor loadings. And I would like to see uh, regress uh, standardized regressions. These are non-standardized regressions. Let me see if I can find it. Output options. Um, no, this one is under, I think, under path. Yes. So what you see uh, is coefficients or non-standardized uh, co uh, regression coefficients. I'm going to change it to beta, which are standardized coefficients. So what's the difference between standardized coefficients and non-standardized coefficients? Again, we have to wait a little bit for Jamovi to f figure it out. Uh, as we are waiting, I should say that coefficients are non-standardized uh, regression path or factor loadings and betas are standardized ones. Um, when we standardize anything, we basically uh, fix the variance of that variable to, uh, to one. So uh, the, the variance of betas um, are equal to one and those betas basically show us how many standard deviations the dependent variable will change per one standard deviation increase in the independent variable. Here, the independent variable is the latent variable. Oh, okay, we're back. This is very good. Here, the independent variable is this one. So if language changes by one standard deviation, for example, if it increases by one standard deviation, what will be the change uh, in standard deviation units in each of these indicators. In this case, uh, if language changes by one SD or standard deviation, um, situational writing total score will change by almost half a standard deviation, 0 
which is um, not very high. I would have liked to see um, coefficient, beta coefficients um, equal to 0 0.7 or greater than 0 0.7. Of course, the model could still be um, acceptable to some people. Uh, if you want to make it more uh, acceptable and um, reliable, what I would do is to remove uh, total writing score here because uh, these guys have got relatively higher uh, beta coefficients. Anyway, so that's another thing that we need to take into account. I'm going to scroll back up to AVE, which is a very important uh, statistic, uh, average variance extracted, and explain what average variance extract means. So average variance extracted refers to the average or the mean of these uh, coefficients, beta co uh, the um, regression coefficients, or lambdas. And um, what we can do to estimate the AVE, you can actually do it manually, is just to sum those standard, some of those standard uh, loadings, um, square them, and divide them by the number of them. I've already done that for language. I want to show you how you can do it in Excel, and you'll get a very simil uh, similar statistic as uh, that in Jamovi. So in Jamovi is 0 0.356. So I'm going to write this down so we won't forget it. 0 0.356. This is in Jamovi. And uh, the one that I've estimated is 0 0.34 something. It's almost similar. The, the reason why they're different is that these are not exact numbers. And Jamovi has uh, rounded them up or down in different ways. That's why we see a little bit of discrepancy between what I've estimated or what and what Jamovi provides us with. So yeah, this is how Jamovi estimates uh, average variance extracted. So you get each of those betas, uh, you multiply them by themselves, so uh, you'll get the square values, and then um, you add them up and divide them by the number of the variables, which is uh, 4 in this case, and you'll get the average variance extracted. Average variance extracted is also known as one of the indications of convergent validity. And by convergent validity, I mean how close are these variables um, in terms of the correlations. In other words, how close are they coming together uh, in order to measure uh, the latent variable, whatever it is. In this case, it's language. So uh, in the same way, we should go through the rest of the models that we have estimated for language, for um, uh, positivity and so on, uh, just to ensure that uh, the convergent validity and the reliability are there and they make sense. Now, another thing that we need to look into is fit statistics. And I've talked about fit statistics before, but I'm going to provide more uh, information in this video just for those of you who might be interested to know a little, just a little bit more about fit statistics. Let's look at the fit statistics of the structural equation model, the main model that I have uh, already generated. I'm going to scroll up to find uh, the yeah, fit values here. As you see, there are a number of fit values that have been estimated. Um, so let's go through these one by one and talk about them. I mean, not all of them, really, because it's not necessary to report all of them. But, but some of them will be quite necessary and useful to report. First of all, fit indicates how well a model can reproduce the raw data for you. Uh, good fit is really necessary, but it's not sufficient. So good fit does not mean that your model is absolutely valid. There are other things that you need to uh, take into account, you need to check the parameter estimates. Haywood cases, uh, I've talked about this in the previous video, but just to refresh your memory if you do not remember what that means, basically uh, it indicates poor discriminant validity or unrealistically high parameter estimates. So if, if you see a parameter estimate uh, which is uh, here, this is a standardized, this is non-standardized actually parameter estimate, let me just make it standardized change it to beta. Uh, if you see 
uh, any parameter estimates that are larger than one, and again, Jamovi is going to uh, take his time to estimate the betas. Uh, if it's larger than bit, uh, one, then we, we're looking at a case of uh, Haywood, Haywood case. I'm sorry, Jamovi is still running the analysis anyway. So Haywood case is basically like that. And we need, we need to always uh, improve the models and try to get better parameter estimates as well as a better uh, fit statistics. So what are these fit statistics in the first place? According to Professor David Kenny's website, um, we can divide those output fit into three different categories. One of them he refers to as incremental fit indices. And I like the way that he explains these three. They're, this may not be extreme, uh, exactly standard in some uh, textbooks, but I think the way that he talks about them is really cool. Incremental fit statistics absolute fit values and also comparative fit, fit stats. The incremental ones uh, consist of um, NFI, and NFI, that's uh, the famous uh, Tucker-Lewis index or non-norm non fit index, and the also famous comparative fit statistics. Most often these two are reported in almost every paper that I've read, you know, I'm sure that you have seen them too. Uh, TLI and NFI are imp is important and CFI is important to report. Now, absolute fit indices are also equally important and perhaps even more important to some people. They include root mean squared uh, error of approximation or uh, RMSEA and also standardized root mean squared residual or um, SRMR. And finally, comparative fit indices, which are only used f to compare different models which are nested inside in each other. Uh, so if you have only one model and if you're looking at the fit index of that um, model, like for example, language, which I just fitted as, as you saw, uh, you don't need to use AC, uh, AIC, BIC or other uh, comparative fit in indices. Now let's go through these and talk about the constraint tenables and perhaps uh, learn a little bit more about them. CFI, TLI, and NNFI, or these two are more or less the same thing. Actually, some people differentiate between them, but to me, they're just the same thing, are incremental measures of fit. And uh, they're reported more often, as I mentioned before. They're high, um, CFI is highly correlated with, with TLI, and uh, it also has some sort of limitation, which is it depends on the average size of the correlations of the data. So if you're the, on average the correlations of the data is low, you would expect to see a, a small CFI. Now, what is uh, the best range or the acceptable range for CFI and in the same way for TLI and, and NNFI? Uh, anything that's above 0 0.9 is fine, but it's much better to get something around 0 0.95 or larger than 0 0.95. In, that, in this case, you can call it good. To some people, um, like uh, David Kenny himself, if you get 0 0.9, you, you have a marginal fit. But interestingly, in language assessment, many people go for 0 0.9 as the uh, minimum acceptable uh, standard for CFI, for TLI, and NNFI. Um, I would say, yeah, aiming for um, you know, a fit index of CFI above 0 0.9 would be much better than, and, uh, sorry, above 0 0.95 would, would, would be, of course, much better than 0 0.9. And these are the formulas for these statistics. I know, I'm not going to go through it. Feel free to pause the video and see how uh, you would, uh, whether you would like to learn more about them or not. Um, I will also leave the, the link to uh, David Kenny's website for you, so in case you want to get more information about incremental fit, uh, you just feel free to go through it. Next one is absolute fit, fit values. Uh, the very useful one is RMSEA, um, which according to McCallum and colleagues in 1996, uh, can be divided into three ranges. The first one, um, is, or it, I mean, it has been interpreted, I advise myself, it, it has been interpreted in, in different ways. The first one is um, 
if it's 0 0.01, uh, it is excellent, the fit is excellent. If this index is 0 0.05, and of course below that, uh, the fit is good. And if it's 0 0.08, it's mediocre. To some people, it's it's actually still acceptable. So 0 0.08. In other um, books, especially standard textbooks of structural equation modeling, you might find 0 0.06. Uh, but 0 0.08 gives you uh, some assurance that you're, uh, you have got a good absolute fit. I mean, not if not good, ex a kind of acceptable absolute fit. Now, uh, to some scholars, 0 0.10 is the cutoff for poor fitting models. So if you get 0 0.10 and anything above that, uh, I'm afraid the model has got a poor absolute fit and you have to modify the model a little bit, even though other fit statistics like CFI and TLI uh, might look pretty good. Okay, so um, there is one more st statistic related to RMSCA, and that's the coefficient interval. That's the lower and upper boundary. The smaller that interval, the better it is. Most uh, software packages like Amos and Jamovi provide you with um, that confidence interval for you. Um, so you can see if, number one, uh, the RMSCA falls within that confidence interval, and number two, if that confidence interval is small. The smaller that interval, the more confidence you have in the reliability of our MSEA. The other thing is, um, uh, other index is SRMR. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's also an absolute fit index. Um, and it refers to the standard standardized differences between the observed correlation and the predicted correlation uh, among those uh, variables in your model. Generally speaking, we like to get an SRMR's value smaller than 0 0.8, pretty much like the RMSCA. So the, the smaller, the better. The closer to zero, the better. The limitation is, um, and that's why some, some people do not report it, um, it's great for small n numbers of variables, so limited uh, models in terms of the number of variables, or low degrees of freedoms. But if the degrees of freedom increase, uh, the, R, uh, the, the standardized root mean square value could also, of residuals could also inc increase. So uh, among these two, uh, this one is preferable and should certainly be reported. And last but not least are the comparative fit statistics like ACAIC uh, information criterion, which is very famous. It's used in different statistics, uh, statistical analyses. Uh, there is no boundaries for these. Simply speaking, the smaller they are, the better the, the comparative fit of the model. So if you're comparing two models, and if one of them has got a comparative fit of, let's say, 95, I'm just you know making it up, and another one has got a, a comparative fit of uh, 92, uh, the one with a smaller number of uh, index of comparative fit is preferable over the other one. And I think that's more or less everything about fit statistics that we need to know. Now we can go through the fit stats for our model and see what we have gotten here. For the CFI is way above 0 0.95, TLI in the same way is above that, and the rest of these statistics, with the exception of PNFI uh, or parsimony normed fit index, are above zero point, uh, and and this one as well, this um, Boland's relative fit index. Um, with these two exceptions, the rest of them are above zero point ninety five. So we can conclude that our our model fits well. Let me see if I can find RMSEA and the rest of them. Um, well. Yeah, they're here. Uh, RMSEA is 0 0.046, which indicates that the model fits pretty well. It's, it's below 0 0.05. So it's it's falling between 0 0.01 and 0 0.05, which in, would indicate something between excellent and good fit. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, SRMR is also way below 0 0.08. And as I mentioned before, the TLI and the CFI are good. So if you just really... Uh, uh, report this uh, table in your 
thesis or in your paper, it will be pretty much pretty good for you. As I mentioned before, uh, RMSCA has got a confidence interval 95%. Uh, the confidence interval is very small because it's be between 0 0.042 and 0 0.051. And as you can see, the RMSCA itself falls between these two. And that's good news for us. Uh, which means that there is uh, no significant deviation, uh, or the model doesn't have a very significant deviation from the covariance of the data, the covariance structure of the data. And that's why the p-value, and I'm uh, really... Uh, I'm delighted to see that RMSCA has got a p-value here as well. Uh, so there is a non-significant p-value here, which is good news for us. It indicates that there is no significant discrepancy between the model that we have created and the covariance structure of the data. That just provides another uh, positive or supporting piece of evidence for the reliability and the validity of our model. Next, we should look at the estimates. Uh, these are uh, the parameter estimates, which basically capture the relationship between language, on the one hand, and its predictors, latent variable predictors. Uh, estimates refer to the non-standardized estimates, and this beta here refers to the standardized estimate. All of these estimates are statistically significant, as indicated by the p-value, and uh, we can interpret them in this way. Uh, for uh, beta, for the beta column, we can say that if positivity uh, goes up by one standard deviation, uh, language also goes up by one standard deviation, uh, by uh, zero, uh, 0 0.133 standard deviations. On the other hand, if motivation goes up by one standard deviation, uh, language uh, drops by 0.136 standard deviations. This is m most uh, likely because standard deviation variables need to be reverse coded, so uh, the relationship between language and motivation will not be uh, reverse. In fact, we do not expect that. We, we expect that the higher the motivation, the higher the language score. Uh, so the directions will most likely change. And next is uh, the relationship between strategy and language, which is captured by this beta coefficient. So if uh, the, the uh, amount of strategy or the magnitude of strategy uh, increases by one standard deviations, uh, language increases by 1.7 uh, by 0 0.178 uh, standard deviations, which is pretty good. So a good amount of variance in language is explained by uh, by these variables. Now, uh, uh, you can also go through these statistics uh, and interpret um, the beta coefficients in the same way. But another important thing to remember is if we find something, some beta coefficient, which is small, especially smaller than 0 0.5, that, uh, that could be removed. I mean, we don't have that, uh, but we, uh, from as far as I can see, but we have something which is small, small as 0 0.502. Uh, for this reason, the AVE index of language was rather smaller than the rest of uh, the AVEs. I'm going to show you that. As you see, uh, the AVE of language is 0 0.352. So AVE is uh, um, very uh, kind of sensitive to the beta coefficients because it's actually the average of those beta coefficients. Uh, the AVE of positivity and motivation is fine. Strategy falls on the borderline of 0 0.5. So for um, av average variance extracted or AVE coefficient, we would like to get something which is at least 0 0.5 and of course above that. The higher the coefficient, the higher our uh, confidence in the convergent validity of our uh, model and our, in this case, in our uh, convergent validity in, uh, of the confirmatory factor analysis models. So uh, that's more or less everything we need to know and we need to report in our CFA 
uh, uh, papers and if you're writing a dissertation or something. And I hope you will find this video useful. Uh, please stay tuned in. I will uh, you know, make more videos on structural equation modeling and, uh, and other related concepts. Uh, I hope to see you soon again. Thank you and goodbye.